Good morning and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I'm the Reverend Mandy Beal. I am the senior minister of this congregation. I'm joined this morning in worship leadership by our co-directors of music ministry, Abha and Stephen Deering, and also with worship associate, Abby Shrek. We have technical support from our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis, and today's Zoom greeter is Mary Jo Ebert. BUC is a spiritual home for all people of goodwill. We are a congregation of many beliefs, many backgrounds and identities. Our social justice work this year is focused in four areas, racial justice, environmental justice, economic inequality, and civic engagement. We are a green sanctuary congregation, which has to do with our commitment to our planet. We are also a welcoming congregation, which is about our commitment to LGBTQI inclusion. For more information about these designations, please visit our website. Worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030 and then later posted on Facebook. After the service, we invite you to stay for virtual coffee hour. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today, we extend a special welcome to you. We hope that you'll stay after the service and get to know us. We have four announcements this morning. First up from our religious education program, Ghosts and goblins and creatures of fight, fright. Don't miss this Zoom call pre-Halloween night. The BCRE Council cordially invites all K through 12 children and their families to join a virtual costume party on Friday, October 30th at 7.30. We will share some not so scary Halloween stories and read a book titled, The Legend of Spookly the Square Pumpkin. So dress up, show up, and let's have some laughs. The information about that will be sent to all registered RA families and can also be found on the meeting calendar. Second, the deadline to contribute to our South Oakland Shelter fundraising campaign has been extended to November 1st. We are joined by our partners at the Muslim Unity Center, UU Church of Farmington, Northwest UU, and Beacon UU, and we are raising funds to provide lunches and dinners for SOS guests during our usual host week, which is November 1st through the 8th. I will say that we have already exceeded the, um, the goal that we set of funding meals for that week, and we are on our way to being able to fund a second week. So we encourage, those, we encourage those donations to continue to roll in so that we can double our goal. You can donate online at the BUC website, and we thank you for your generosity thus far. Next up, join the membership committee for a second session of Getting to Know Unitarian Universalism, which is today after the service. This is an interactive, fun, and introspective class series for anyone interested in learning more about BUC, exploring UU, or wanting to deepen relationships with others in the congregation. Those classes are co-led by Brianna Zamborski and Rob Davidson. Coffee hour today will end at 11.45 so that we can start the classes on time at noon. It is a different link than the one you use to log into the service. And that link can be found on the meeting calendar on our website. And lastly, a note about worship. We recently received a suggestion to pause the recording of our worship services during Joys and Sorrows. And that means that Joys and Sorrows will not be posted on Facebook after the service, and that might help people feel more comfortable sharing in a virtual format. If you want to submit a joy or a sorrow or something in between, there is a link for that on our website too. Thank you again for joining us this morning or whenever you're watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit and it is good to be together again. And with that, our service will begin. Good morning. This morning's prelude is by Argentinian composer, Maximo Diego Pujol. And it is a celebration of a region of Buenos Aires called San Telmo. <laughs> Thank you. 
me just take a second to, um, to hold space for how exciting and incredible that was and um, how grateful we are to benefit from such a diverse music ministry in this congregation that, that I think really benefits us all. Okay, so with that, we worship in our separate homes this morning, but we are joined by a multitude of Unitarian Universalists and lighting our chalice. Our chalice is lit this morning to honor the virtue of humility. From that spark grows the flames of justice, kindness, and decency. These are the values to which we aspire in our relationships and in our world. Maybe. Our first hymn this morning is Break Not the Circle, number 323. Our opening words this morning are A Network of Mutuality by Martin Luther King Jr. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. Hatred and bitterness can never cure the disease of fear. Only love can do that. We must evolve for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. Before it is too late, we must narrow the gaping chasm between our proclamations of peace and our lowly deeds which precipitate and perpetuate war. One day we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal that we must seek, but a means by which we arrive at that goal. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. We shall hew out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to create a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. This is to the work to which we give our time, talent, and treasure. It's true that we need your offerings to pay for our light bills and our mortgage and our Zoom account, but it is that mission to which your money goes. All of those things are in support of our mission. So let there be an offering of support for this beloved community and our good works. Contributions can be made through our website and through Venmo with, with username at BUCMI. You can always put a check in the mail. So in an act of love and support for our congregation, I invite you to please give generously. In honor of this month where there's so much disparity in the way people are feeling about things, we have to work on getting along. And uh, this song inspired us um, in the way that Reverend Mandy's prompts about this month did. 
This is made famous, of course, by Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald. And it's a song by George and Ira Gershwin. from a, a much needed moment of levity into the time of our service that we set aside for spiritual practices such as prayer and grounding and reflection. And we'll begin with the sharing of joys and sorrows. And again, we'll pause the recording of our service here. I invite you now to move further into a spirit of prayer and centering with me as we bring these joys and these sorrows and those that are unspoken and remain in our heart to bear. We bear witness to them. We bring them into this space. Through our time together, may we be blessed by the love of community held in the warmth of our relationships, emboldened in the justice and the truth that we hold dear. May we continue to keep our heads above water or perhaps bring our heads above water in this time of turmoil. May we find comfort here. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Be ours a religion which like sunshine goes everywhere, its temple all space, its shrine the good heart, its This reading comes from the Christian scriptures, Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, 
from the new international version. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. As we continue our exploration of the divisions in our nation, we come today to a piece of ancient wisdom about how to get along with others. This morning's text expertly delivered by Abby is a letter from Paul written to the church in Philippi. Now, this was written sometime during the second half of the first century, probably within decades of Jesus's crucifixion. Paul was the architect of the early church movement. Churches in those times were very different. They were small, subversive communities. Many members of those churches cut their familial relationships or they were cut for them when they joined the church. Sometimes a few families would join together. Early churches were small ragtag communities of outcasts, often considered dangerous. It was almost like a radical fringe group or the rebel alliance from Star Wars. After all, their purpose was to spread the teachings of a man who was executed by the state because his teachings were found dangerous. Paul's general pattern was to establish a church, to leave before he was arrested, be arrested somewhere else, and then write letters to check back in on the churches that he had established. The Christian canon includes many of those letters, and those letters tend to give instruction and advice on how churches should operate. A lot of his work is about how people in those churches should behave. Now, a word about Paul. It is easy to dismiss Paul's teachings because he was a product of his time. He wrote some things that are hard, almost intolerable on the modern ear. But if we can give his work a gracious reading, there is a lot of practical advice about how people can live together peaceably. Paul's work addresses human behavior in the context of covenanted religious communities and people have always been people and the same issues will always arise. It appears his purpose on this passage is to clear up a power struggle between a few of the founding members of the church in Philippi, excuse me. And he does so by appealing to the virtue of humility that was modeled by Jesus. The early Christians understood Jesus to be both fully God and fully human, and that is a belief that is shared by many modern Christians. And in this theology, if Jesus is God and God is omnipotent, then that means that Jesus chose not to use the power that was available to him. He humbled himself and accepted human limitations during his life, including the conditions of his death. And what Paul is saying is that Jesus could have used supernatural power to avoid crucifixion, but he chose not to. And he did so as a testament to the power of humility. The reason that Jesus upset religious authorities and political authorities so much was his insistence on overturning human systems of power and oppression. He wanted to upend the social order. And he went around preaching about equality and radical love. He healed heathens and he hung out with women and children and people who were disabled and they hated that. Jesus's death was the predictable conclusion of making so many enemies in high places. And he did that, all of that, on purpose. He fully and freely chose a human life with all of its 
limitations. And there is a theological term for this. It is a Greek word, kenosis, which translate roughly as self-limitation, kenosis. That will not be on the final, but it is extra credit if you learn that word. Now, Paul leans into this idea of voluntarily self-limiting in his advice about how to settle a power dispute. Paul could have written back and said, well, this person is right and that one is wrong. He could have said, put it to a vote or more likely for the time, draw lots to determine who gets to win. He could have offered to send an adjudicator because he was in jail, he couldn't go himself. But instead, his advice to them was to voluntarily give up some of the power. If you struggle for power, just give some of it up. He tells them to take on each other's cares and concerns. Early churches wanted to imitate the life of Jesus by continuing his subversion of human power structures. So Paul's advice to them about an internal power struggle was to apply the same approach by practicing self-limitation and humility in their personal relationships. Instead of settling disputes for the use of power, he instructs them to put each other's needs first. He calls them out of the struggle for power and into deep humility. Selfishness is a part of the human condition. It is endemic to us. It is in our nature to want to win, to want more, to want it our way. And that causes problems. Every person cannot have what they want. That's just now how it works. If you've ever tried to order a single pizza with more than two people, you know that it cannot be done. And this idea of self-limitation as a subversion to power and oppression is not just one obscure reference in the book of Philippians. It, the idea of making room for each other was central to the early church and Paul actually wrote about it a lot. In his letter to the church in Galatia, he wrote, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. That's Galatians 6.2. And in Colossians 3.12, we find, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Paul's letters have a clear message. If you want to live according to the life that Jesus modeled, you have to take each other into consideration. You have to prioritize each other's needs. Sometimes you have to give up what you want for the good of those around you. You matter, but you are not the only one who matters. Prioritizing the needs of others is integral to Paul's theology. And like the church in ancient Philippi, our country is engaged in a power struggle there are voices on one side saying that women, people of color, the LGBTQ community, undocumented people have too many rights. And the argument is that providing equitable legal protection for these groups will somehow weaken the moral fabric of our nation. And ironically, maddeningly, Christianity is usually cited as the reason that these groups should not have the legal protections that they need. Any philosophy, any theology can become distorted. And in this case, a religion with so many beautiful, realistic ideas and, and aspirations that has been twisted to enable those base human tendencies that it was meant to heal, like selfishness. It has lost, Christianity has lost one of its core, most essential messages and that is the requirement to pull against the tendency towards selfishness by putting the needs of others above your own. Selfishness in our time has become dangerous. It is in our nature to pursue the things that we want and in our context, those who have socioeconomic political power are essentially unchecked in their ability to have it their way. Policies and actions have been taken at the federal level to shore up the powerful by frankly endangering those without equal access to that power. Policies and actions like religious exemptions that allow pharmacists to opt out 
of filling prescriptions for birth control, religious exemptions that allow physicians to refuse life-saving medical care that is needed to complete a miscarriage, policies and actions like redefining how Title IX is interpreted to adjudicate allegations of sexual assault on college campuses so that it overwhelmingly favors the accused, policies and actions that embolden white supremacists, policies and actions that do not hold police officers accountable for the deaths of black and brown people, especially disproportionately overwhelmingly black men. Policies and actions such as ending mandatory bias training for federal employees, systematically invalidating transgender identities and most recently completely unsolicited statements from the Supreme Court justices that call same-sex marriage ruinous for our nation. Policies and actions like forcing people who are seeking asylum at our southern border to wait in makeshift camps with deplorable conditions in Mexico or arresting American citizens for leaving water in the Sonoran Desert. Policies and actions like separating infants and children from their parents and putting them in cages and then losing the parents of over 500 of those children. And these things done in a vile mispronunciation of the name of Christ. There is no way that these policies and actions can be reconciled with Paul's admonishment. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It does not matter how someone might try to make some type of claim that is a religious impulse that drives them to want to limit legal protections for marginalized groups. The only purpose of those policies and those actions is to maintain the balance of power in favor of those who already have it. As we consider the healing potential of making room for each other, we need to be mindful that we're not talking about making space for a specific set of people here. When we take on the cares and the concerns of another, it is not the cares and concerns of the people who already have the majority share of social power, political capital, or wealth. They have plenty of room. Power does not need more power. What Paul meant is that we have to take on the cares and the concerns of those outside of those power structures. He meant to hold space for those who need it, to give a little breathing room to those who cannot breathe. As we apply this scripture to the consideration of the pressing questions of our day, to the, the gross injustices of our day, we are compelled to ask ourselves not what policies and candidates best serve our needs, but the needs of those who have less power than us, the ones on the margins of society. Perhaps you are not particularly concerned about a threat to your civil rights. And if so, then you are called to be concerned about the civil rights of others. Look not to your own interests, but to each of you to the interests of others. Considering the needs of others is a through line to modern Unitarian Universalism. The Judeo-Christian tradition is one of the six sources of our faith, the official six sources. It is Christian scriptures like these that provide the basis of our first principle. That's literally where the first principle comes from. The affirming of the inherent worth and dignity of all people is based on this theology among others from that tradition. It is therefore our right and our responsibility to use scriptures like this to further the cause of justice in our time. When the needs of the mighty are amplified while others live in fear, it is our job, our 
duty as people of faith and the direct inheritors of this theological imperative to proclaim loudly, publicly, the necessity of elevating the concerns of those at the margins of power. Now, beloved, we are at a crucial turning point in the history of our nation. The solemnity of this election cannot be overstated. And the time has come. The time's come for us to speak this truth every way that we can, including with our vote. The election is underway and it ends next Tuesday. So vote, vote your values, vote with your heart on your sleeve, vote for the rights that don't matter to you because you know that they matter to someone else. Vote like your life depends on it and do that because you know that someone else's life does. So may that be so. Amen and blessed be. Thank you, Reverend Mandy. Our last hymn today is number 402, From You I Receive. Go now out into this world and take with you this message, this imperative of humility and putting the needs of others on top. Go as a beacon of hope, justice, dignity, and decency, and make that so. May it be so through our actions. Amen. <laughs>